This is a beautiful painting by a lesser-known American artist named Alexander Wyant. I was so captured by this piece that I wanted to learn more about the artist, so I decided to research his body of work. I discovered that this was actually fairly atypical of his normal style. The work he's best known for is actually much more impressionistic and, eventually, even slightly abstract. This piece is from earlier in his career, when his work was more reflective of the Hudson River School, or the work of the realists. These paintings were highly detailed, but as he aged and observed other artists and other styles, he began to incorporate elements of what he saw into his own work. Artists such as Courbet, Millet, and Constable were an influence. But perhaps the biggest influence came from fellow American artist George Innes, a popular landscape painter of the time. The two men eventually met, and Innes was instrumental in helping Wyant get his start. The majority of Wyant's work is associated with what is known as the American Barbizon style a more emotional, looser form of painting than the Hudson School. This evolution in style, however, isn't unusual. We see this with almost every artist, which makes researching a master's full body of work so fascinating. I have a few theories as to why their styles change over time. First, a creative mind likes to explore, likes to try new things, and find new ways to express what they see. I'm an artist as well, and I find that I sometimes get bored. I just want to do something different. To me, boredom is the death knell to creativity, so I have to think that perhaps some of the masters experienced this as well. It's a possibility. Others, like Wyant, may have been enamored by the work of another artist and decided to apply some of what they saw to their own work. Another possible factor is health. At the young age of 37, Alexander Wyant suffered a debilitating stroke, after which he had to learn to paint with his non-dominant hand. He didn't let this stop him, however, painting successfully for nearly 20 more years. As a result of observing the work of other artists and learning to paint with his left hand, we can see a fairly dramatic shift in his brushwork. And then again at age 50, when his entire right side became paralyzed. Still, he continued to paint. I personally like almost all of his work, all of his styles. He seems to have a beautiful and unusual expression of color. The colors are realistic, and yet enhanced. For example, this autumn scene so accurately and brilliantly captures the colors of fall that when I see it, I remember the feeling as a girl of being enveloped by the colors of autumn and the smell of fallen leaves on a cool day. It just brings me back. In fact, look at this painting side by side with the sunset piece both by the same artist, but using different color palettes and different brushwork. What they have in common is the ability to draw you in, as well as the simplicity of the scene. They're not cluttered or complex, giving you a chance visually to rest and take in the moment. Some of that feeling, though, is due to the artist's knack for capturing color. Interestingly, the foreground brushwork isn't that different between the two paintings. You can even see a similarity in how he handles the trees. The biggest differences are how he handled the distant landscape and how he handled the sky. This one has the nice gradient glazes of color, while this one uses more broken brushwork. Let's take a closer look at these two paintings. Here we've zoomed into the sunset painting. The first thing I want to look at is the sky. If you look very closely, it appears to be constructed of several glazes of color. You can see a blue tone that looks like it was possibly the bottom layer. You can see a hint of pink or a mauve color. As we move to the right, there appears to be a thin layer of gold. And the closer you get to the right, 
the more gold you see, meaning a thickening of the paint or more opacity. On top of that, you have some small areas of more impasto paint and some darks. So the sky was built from layers of glaze and then some thicker, more opaque paint on top for accents. If we move down and look at the mountains, there may be sky color there as well. I would guess he has an initial layer of that same blue from the sky, and then glazes of pink or mauve, golds, and then maybe a dusky gray. If we move down further and look at the greens, these initially look artificial. But if you've ever stood in a situation like that, there is a strange color cast that the elements take on, a kind of unnatural but beautiful tone, and I think that's what he captures here. Now look closely at the brushwork. Notice the trees and the leaves. Notice the distant trees, and then the mid-ground shrubbery. It's made of small scumbles of color. On the left-hand side over here, you can see hints of sunlit bark. Just a few strokes. Down in the shaded area here, that is very loosely painted. You can see some directional strokes and areas where the paint is quite thin. And then there's opacity over top, like this gray. So let's compare this to the other painting, the looser one. If we zoom into this one, you can see that this is a very different way to paint the sky. You can still see a possible base layer, this blue, I think. It's a little hard to tell with this level of scumbling. But you can see yellow paint and white, a grayish, almost a green tone. And you can see his heavy brushwork. So let's see how he handled the distant land in this piece. Very abstract compared to the prior painting. The same artist, but he allows entire brush strokes to communicate an entire land mass here. Look at the trees. They're almost solid color. Just a hint at a tree through the shape and the mark at the bottom. But it works. Notice the peaks of chromatic blue. An underpainting, I think. A nice, strong complement to the golds, but very subtly placed. It's literally a color complement. And now look at the handling of these trees. Look at the broken brushwork. It looks like he painted on a very dark green. And then over the green, he paints dabs and dashes of brown, working his way up to the lighter tones. And then finally, he has a multicolored trunk, just a sweep or two to communicate that. When we look at the foreground, we see broken strokes, but they're also almost blended. They're not long or fluid marks, they're short movements. And if you look closely, you can see some of the layering. To me, it looks like he painted dark to light. Over on this side, it looks like he implied an area of water because you have a little bit of reflection right here. Basically, everything is implied. But when you back up, it communicates correctly. You have this all-over feeling of excitement and color. So, two very different paintings, very different palettes, very different styles, but they both draw you in. Every artist adjusts some aspect of their style over time. I think we just need to appreciate each master's artistic journey and see it as part of the human experience.